just a big Charleston contest. I am uh, Stefano. I am an Italian man. You've reached the house of unrecognized talent. Don't you worry, never fear. Drop and hot will soon be here. Oh, wait a minute. This is where I came in. Domo Arigato, Mr. Scotto. And welcome back to the Brooklyn's Dad Talks About Everything podcast. This is your humble host, Michael Scotto, in the city of Greensboro, in the great state of North Carolina, one of our original 13 today on the podcast. We're going to be looking for a hero. No, 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 no. We're going to ask you to stop looking for a hero. You know, you've got to be your hero. And in a small H, but you got to have a big hero. There's only one of those. And it ain't coming around the corner anytime soon on this planet, from this source, from these people, from the politicians or the astronauts or the nobodies or the this, that, or the nothers or the anybody. Hang on. I need a hero. I'm holding out for a hero till the end of the night. It's got to be strong. Got to be fast. It's got to be fresh from the fight. I mean, that should be obvious. I need a hero. I'm holding out for a hero till the morning light. Not just at the end of the night now. Now it's still the morning light. It's got to be sure. It's got to be soon. It's got to be larger than life. Larger than life. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what people are doing. They're holding out for a hero. I see this a lot uh, online. People of every background, of every political sway, holding out for a hero. They think it's coming. They think it's going to be the, you know, they have victory on uh, election night and they're celebrating and happy days are here again, etc. And it just doesn't always pan out. Again, we've talked before about things getting slightly better. Uh, slightly worse, the ups and downs, but the downward trend has been uh, consistent for decades now. The United States is a it's an empire. Uh, it's an it's an overblown empire. Thirty one trillion dollars in debt now, with no end in sight to the debt. Constantly borrowing money. Our military. Uh, I just saw today a report on military readiness, and apart from the Marines, uh, the other services are not doing so well. Uh, they're depleted. Uh, the ranks are depleted partially because of the the mandate to be vaccinated and the taking away our liberty to make that choice. And our servicemen and women were not allowed to make that choice. I think the army was 25% short of its goal for recruiting, uh, partly because of that, because of partly because of the army becoming a test tube for social engineering. And people don't want to join the military for that. And they see how veterans are treated uh, after their service, particularly some of our older veterans, uh, some who fought in wars, whether they even go back to Vietnam, that are some of them are left, and possibly even Korea, but certainly those from Iraq, the wars in the Middle East. And they see how they're treated, and they see that people coming across the border illegally, uh, many with ill intent, the drug trade, the human trafficking trade, rape, drugs, etc. So with all that, and they're given health care, housing, an income of sorts, and they're and now they're given the right to vote. And people are seeing this, and veterans are seeing this, and what I'm saying is that you can I can pick any group. Um even even African Americans going back to the fifties and sixties, they're waiting for a hero. And we love heroes. And I have my heroes in different areas, music and sports and everything, but I have them, hopefully, I have them within context. Like I said, I, I mean, I love Paul McCartney. I think he's a, a brilliant genius, uh, really the greatest all-around musical, pop musical artist of our of our lives. Uh, but I don't care what the guy has to say on, on just about any other subject apart from music. If he's going to talk about bass, if he's going to talk about production, if he's going to talk about songwriting, yes, I want to listen to Paul McCartney. And if he wants to talk about the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 and its effects on Hegelian thought in the modern age, I really don't care. I don't care about any position on geopolitics or medicine or anything else. Same thing with, with other things like baseball. I have my baseball heroes, and I love when they talk about baseball. Unfortunately, most of the people I like, like in baseball, they don't talk about other things, fortunately. You know, now it's okay if they go into that field, like Jack Kemp. 
was a, a football star, and he went into politics and was well versed on different topics. And uh, I liked a lot of what he had to say, a lot of the ideas he had for the inner cities, uh, things like that. And I supported him, I think, in 1988. Again, anybody I support is going nowhere. So, of course, he went nowhere. That's the way it is, because those are people that I, I root for for other, <laughs> for other reasons than what people want. They don't, they're not the hero that people want. Now, in my life, there have been some decent heroes. I think Ronald Reagan uh, was, was a good man. And I think he did a lot of good things. And he did come in and he was somewhat heroic. I know people are freaking out right now because they hate Ronald Reagan. But whoever it is, in, you know, in, in some ways we can, we can find those people who accomplished things. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have named Reagan because I didn't want to start coming down on any side. People like Jack Kemp are fine because most people don't even remember him. Most of the people remember him from his football career, not his political career. Uh, but again, even today, I've said this before, I'm a Rand Paul guy. He's going nowhere. Rand Paul will never have power. You have nothing to worry about there. If he runs again, he's not going to get a lot of support. Uh, but I think he, he makes a lot of sense. But he doesn't present himself. He's not the hero people want, which is probably why people are drawn to men like like Donald Trump or to the Black Lives Movement. These people are presented as martyrs slash heroes. And that's what people want. And that's a dangerous place to be. You know, Robin Hood will soon be here. I mean, that's what we're waiting for. Oh, brother, this is where I came in. I mean, even, let's let's go into the theological world briefly. This is where people want their theological heroes. And, you know, we're all prone to having heroes in that area as well. We have to be careful. And I know there's people I like. I like E.W. Bollinger and Stuart Allen and Charles Welch and Oscar Baker, people like that. You know, they're all dead. <laughs> uh, but even now, it's just watching Brian Kelson. I enjoy his studies on YouTube. Excellent, excellent stuff. Uh, and others. And, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But again, they're not authorities. They're not authorities. People, particularly evangelicals who claim sola scriptura and the historic position of sola scriptura, which is in the scriptures alone, these are people that would then say the scriptures alone plus the early church fathers, plus the catechism plus the creeds, or whatever. No, no, it's this solo scriptura. The whole idea was the, the putting the, the Bible in the hands of the plowboy. I forget how Luther said it, uh, uh, a man armed with scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without it, a workman armed with scripture, etc. So anyway, that's the idea. It's this, the idea of, of, you know, we come together, of course, and we support one another, and we love one another, and we help one another. And some of us have more insight in some areas. But still, at the end of the day, you could have studied the book of Jonah, every verse, broken it down in the Hebrew. So you know more than I do. But when you give me that information, I still have the responsibility of checking it out, checking out your study, checking out uh, the conclusions you come to against the Word of God, against the whole counsel of God, finding Jonah in its place in Scripture, what it's, what it's there for, to whom it applies. Now, again, this is, this is lovely because I don't know a whole lot of people that do that. Everybody wants to take a name upon themselves. Now, I, I, if people ask me what my theology is, I have a name for it, but I don't like to use it. But it gives them a starting point. I just want them to talk to me and ask me what I believe. Because when I tell them and I give them a category, they automatically tell, start telling me what I believe. You know, 99 times out of 100, they're wrong about some part of it. They make tremendous assumptions. And the problem is then when they go to their scripture with their system, they are not able to see at least the argument I'm making, even if they don't accept it. You know, it's got to be able to see the argument. You can say, oh, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but I, I don't even get that. I just get correction. <laughs> and you know, nobody says that. Early church fathers and the traditions of the church and historic Christianity and all these other things that are departure from sola scriptura. But anyway, enough of that. Because I know this uh, this podcast goes out to numbering in the single single digits, and that's the way it's been. That's the way it's going to be. Uh, even the Bible studies I've taught, and my well, the Bible the Bible my blog, and my blog gets some kind of traffic. Not much, again, in the grand scheme of things. And but most of it's a lot of it's, or I say most of it overall is international, generally from places where Christians can't get information. Believers have difficult time places like China you know, or even in the Middle East, etc. some of those countries. So that's fine. 
I'm not in this to get a name for myself because honestly, I don't want, <laughs> I wouldn't want, I shun success. I've always shunned success. I was in my music for the art. I was never in it for success. Are you kidding? I would have sold my soul out when I was, particularly before I was a believer, when I was in a band. By the way, did I mention I was in a band? Yes, it's Nothing But Sky for all of you out there. It's on Spotify. You can search Nothing But Sky. There we are from the 90s. Anyway, I mean, I had a lot of fun doing it, and I still enjoy playing, but I have no grandiose plans for my life. Again, today is just a it's me babbling on here for 10 minutes or so, and we'll probably go maybe to 15 today. See, it's difficult to get these things done because I work all week. Now, during COVID, and I'm near my equipment and I'm at home, work slowed down, particularly at the beginning of COVID. So I was still checking my emails every day and maybe taking a phone call or two, but I'm a facilities manager. There wasn't a whole lot I could do from home. you know. And, and the campus had slowed down because we sent everybody home. So I had a lot of time early. Now it's more difficult because I'm working every day. And then I come home at night. I have my small group for my church on Mondays. I have the uh, Pal Talk Bible study I participate in. I teach about once every eight or nine weeks on that. And I get tremendous teaching from the other men on there uh, on Tuesday nights. Pal Talk, it's the Musterian group. If you're interested to jump in on a pal, on Pal Talk, download the app. Musterian, M-U-S-T-E-R-I-O-N. Wednesday nights, we have the Carolina Bible group that's uh, taught... Cecil teaches that one on Wednesday nights. I listen to that. So I basically have Thursdays and and then the weekend is getting stuff done around the house. Uh, so, and, you know, being with my wife, when I have my honey-do list, there's a good homespun humor. So anyway, I say all that to say so anyway. I try not to say so anyway too often. So anyway, I say all that to say that it's just been, it's it's somewhat frustrating to at least watch people buying into a system and buying into a preacher. And even if you get into a discussion with someone, you get a cut and paste. And that's not all the time. I'm not, I'm not blanking that. I get some very good discussions online. And there's some people who sincerely love the Lord and have some very good points to make. And one thing I'm very clear to say is I don't have all the answers. I'm not all knowing. I have a decaying mind like everybody else and a limited intellect like everyone else. So I don't have every answer for everything. All I ever really want to do is if, if somebody understands where I'm coming from. If they understand it, they can choose to reject it or not, but at least they'll understand the argument, the scriptural argument. And then if I can try to understand their scriptural argument, we can kind of find a place where we can at least discuss. And I have those conversations, so I'm not, this is not a blanket statement that I could never have and nobody out there is doing that. But, you know, there's been times where, again, I've told this story maybe before, uh, the one time I was online and a woman, she's really trying to understand, and she read something I wrote, and we shared back and forth, and she goes, oh, I really see this, but that's not what my church teaches. And that was pretty much the end of the discussion, because that's not what her church teaches. Well, I don't I don't care what your church teaches. <laughs> you know, I've said this too, you know, where I go fellowship locally, the small group I'm in, the place where my wife and I go and worship and listen to the preaching, they don't have the same understanding of the scripture that I do. Now, we're all in Christ. We all are resting in Christ. We all love the Lord. Hope Our hope is solely in the death, burial, lack of decay, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, we believe in all that. We love the Scripture, right? And we learn from the Scripture together, and we grow, and we support each other. All that's fine. But, you know, there's a lot of things like, again, I, I, don't, I wouldn't go to the book of Matthew a lot. <laughs> you know, for, I wouldn't go for it at all for teaching for today unless it's a very generic statement there. I mean, that's part of scriptural understanding. It's, it's knowing not only the audience, not only the audience that's being addressed, but also the whether what kind of truth it is. Is it truth for the kingdom on earth? Is it truth for those of us in the body who have a heavenly hope? Is it truth for the apostles and not for the rest of us? Some of the truths like that. Uh, is, there, is, it, is it truth uh, for a Gentile in certain ages? So those are the kinds of things. Or is it, and the other thing, too, is, is, is it truth? That's universal. God is love. Okay, God is love. That's in Scripture. It's a universal truth. God is love. That's what God is. That doesn't change. But it doesn't mean that the whole book, that First John, is written to me, to me, for me, sure, not to me. And that's sort of the final irony. One of the things about coming to this position and understanding of the age in which we live that has nothing to do with the kingdom on earth 
nothing to do with the gospel of the kingdom, nothing to do with all the instructions for the kingdom or the 12 tribes or Israel, those sorts of things, is that people would say that we're, we're throwing out the rest of the Bible, we're dismissing. It's, it's far from it, because what we can do is what we try to do is we go and, and look at Galatians or Romans or the book of Acts and see, you know what they're doing there? Paul didn't just make that up. He's quoting, he's quoting scripture. He's quoting Isaiah. We read it as though it's a New Testament. And even the Lord, when the Lord talks about the gates of hell, he didn't just make that up. He's quoting Hezekiah from Isaiah 38. Hezekiah said, I will go down to the gates of Sheol. And I'll no longer see the Lord in the land of the living. Sheol is, would be the Greek, would be the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek Hades. It's the state of the dead. It's where believers go. Paul says that of us in first, well, of, of believers in 1 Corinthians 15. They're in Hades. And again, Paul is quoting in there, when a death were as I stay in grave was a victory. He's quoting, he's quoting from scripture, from the Old Testament prophets. You know, that's important to know. It's important to know where Paul got that from, from Moses and the prophets. He's getting all these things. The book of Romans is heavily dependent upon the Old Testament. Galatians makes its argument for justification based on the Old Testament. So all those things are for Israel. All those things were given to Israel. All those things are part of Israel's plan. You know, even though there's truths there for us, I'm not saying there's not truths in Romans or Galatians, there certainly are. But the context there, like in 1 Corinthians, the body in 1 Corinthians that differs from the body in Ephesians, the, the idea of a bride, which is different, which the bride is separate, right, from the head. The, the bride has her own head. And then, of course, the bride in Scripture is clearly spoken of as Israel or virgin Israel. It's the new covenant. Israel will be cleansed someday. And then we see the, the city coming down as a bride, adorned as a bride, in the new Jerusalem, we see the new heavens and the new earth. And then we go there and we look at the new heavens and the new earth in Revelation. We go, they get it's, John got that from the Revelation, but it's based on Isaiah, Isaiah 66, in the new heavens and the new earth. And that's where Gehenna is, and that's where the throwing of the carcasses is. And then we're back, we're back to the Lord's ministry, speaking about Gehenna, that Paul doesn't talk about, by the way. But that's, that's where the Lord is talking about. He's talking about a future, these specific events. When the Lord talks about paradise, when he's on the cross. Right? He's, there's a specific thing, paradise. It's where the tree of life is, we're told in the Revelation. Right? And where's the tree of life? The tree of life is what Adam lost. So we're, the Bible is, is it's forward and then backward. Right? There's all this story forward, and then there's the undoing of everything at the end of the Revelation. The undoing of the curse, the undoing of death, the undoing of the curse on Adam all the way through. Death is the last enemy. Death was the first enemy. Death is the last enemy. Right? And so when death is undone, and then Adam, whomever, is destined for that, access to the tree of life in paradise. But it's not, the Lord wasn't in paradise the day he died. He couldn't be. He said, I will be, the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish. So that's where he was. He tells us where he was. He was in the belly of the earth. He commends his spirit unto the Father. That's his life. Life goes back to the Father. So then he bowed his head. He died. He was in the grave three days and three nights. His soul was in Hades. But that's just the state of the dead. Who he is was, was in a state of death. The Lord's not a triune God on his own. <laughs> He's not, we're not triune little gods. <laughs> and he wasn't triune. The Lord was dead. He was in the grave. That's where he said he was for three days and three nights. He wasn't in heaven. So if he wasn't in heaven that day, then you have to, you have to go back and when he says to the, the thief, or I mean the benefactor, remember there were five crosses, not three. You go back and listen to that message. But he says to him, you know, today you'll be with me in paradise. But he doesn't say that. He says, I, will, I say unto you this day, you'll be with me in paradise. Which is a very, scripture uses that. There's an Old Testament equivalent of that too. I, the Lord, I say unto you this day. Right? It doesn't mean, it's a, it's a proclamation of truth. It doesn't mean it's happening that day. That you'll be with me in paradise. Well, the Lord wasn't in paradise that day. Paradise doesn't show up until the end of the Revelation. Well, in the beginning of the Revelation, it's promised to those going through the tribulation that if they endure, they will be in the paradise of God. But what is that? Well, we, where the tree of life is, and then where does the tree of life show up? shows up at the end of the Revelation, chapter 21, 22, at the end. So you can see how all these things, uh, have to under, you have to understand this whole prophecy. And then in the middle of all that, you have Paul saying, I have a revelation that was not given to the, the prophets, was unknown, it's hidden from before the foundation of the ages, before creation, before Adam, before Noah, before Abraham, before the law, before David in the kingdom, this was hidden and revealed only to Paul. And then he reveals this truth in the book of Ephesians, that we've talked about before. But again, it, because we read the Old Testament and the prophets and we understand Paul's ministry in the Acts was 
He declared nothing he said that wasn't spoken of by Moses and the prophets. That was his ministry. He was declaring the kingdom spoken of in the prophets and in Moses, which is the law. And that's what he did. That's what the Lord did. The Lord came in under the law. The Lord came in to Israel alone. We've covered that. And last time we talked about Matthew, the Lord clearly tells people he's only talking to Israel. Don't talk to Gentiles. Don't give this gospel of the kingdom of Gentiles. Nothing to do with him. Son of David has nothing to do with him. The Gentiles. Putting all these things together, and over 20 minutes now, that we're, we have to rightly divide the word of truth. It's not a crazy concept. It's not some cultish thing. It's handling carefully the word of God. Comparing things that differ, as it says in Philippians 1. You have to compare those things that differ. Otherwise, you have a lot of contradictions. Or you end up saying things like, well, what about all these things in Matthew and Luke that we talked about before? Well, the Lord is making a point. The Lord, he clearly says things. He clearly teaches things. Well, well he, was, he wasn't, he was no, he says he's talking to his disciples, the little flock. When his disciples came to him, Peter came to him, and he answers them these questions. It, the Lord's not lying to them. He's telling them truths. Right? And then the Pharisees come to him, and he, he tells them a story about Lazarus and the rich man, and people want to make, take that as, as truth. When it's not, it's, 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 it's a mockery of their their doctrine of Abraham's bosom, which makes no sense. Where did, where did Adam go? Where did Abel go? Where did Noah go? Where did Methuselah go? You know, <laughs> where did Abraham go? Did Abraham go to Abraham's bosom? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, we're not, maybe we'll talk about that. I mean, maybe we have talked about it last year in series one. Anyway, I'm going to finish now. I like to be on, you know, 25 minutes is pretty far. So anyway, this is just tonight's rant. Maybe I'll get my this weekend. And, uh, so uh, Robin Hood is here. So do not fear. Robin Hood will soon be here. The only Messiah that you should be looking for coming is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to be appearing soon. After that, he will be coming back to the earth soon.